Hey everyone, John from Bike Fit Advisor. So many times when I do a bike fit, one of the questions or one of the goals that comes up from the rider is that they want to be, they want to get their bar position as low as possible. They want to be more aggressive and ostensibly more aerodynamic. Now, whether having a lower bar position is always aerodynamic is kind of another video that we can address at another time. What I want to go over today is how do we determine what that optimal bar height is? Essentially, how low is too low for you? Now, wanting to get lower with your bar position is fine, but we need to understand that there are trade-offs, especially as we near sort of our end range for it. And there are a lot of factors that go into how low you can get your bar. There's your morphology, like how long your torso is, how long your arms are, etc. It's also dependent on your mobility, your flexibility, you know, and also your strength and a, and a number of other factors. Now, trying to teach in this type of setting um, how to assess flexibility and strength and also take into account somebody's physical characteristics is fairly complicated and especially as you start throwing in more variables it, it, it get, just gets unwieldy. But I think we can approach this from a different standpoint and make it simpler. We're going to talk about some symptoms that can come up when we have too low of a bar position and we can kind of work backwards from there. Now just know that I'm going to be approaching this from the standpoint of the rider who has kind of already looked at their cleat position and their saddle position and even if things aren't completely perfect there, they've, they've, they've figured a few things out. And we're just kind of isolating the bar position. We kind of have to. Otherwise, again, we get too many variables involved. And we're also kind of taking it from a standpoint of someone that's riding that is reasonably comfortable, doesn't really have symptoms necessarily, uh, and they're wondering if they can go lower. Now, if you already have symptoms and you're wondering if your bar height is creating them, you can, you can do, use all this same information, but you're going to be doing things in a little different way. So instead of progressively lowering the bar and just keeping an eye out for these symptoms, the person that is already having some problem on the bike, you can actually do the opposite. You can actually change your bar height, raise it slightly in a progressive way again, a little bit at a time, and see if the symptoms that you're experiencing change in any way. Do they get better or worse? Do they go away completely? But all the same information should apply here. So in my experience bike fitting, there are two main limiters that people have, and they are the proper pelvic or optimal pelvic angle, and the second one is our readily available amount of hip flexion. So every one of us has sort of a narrow range of pelvic angle where the pelvis is actually going to be stable powerful, and will also be comfortable, okay? And if we go outside of this range, if we push it too far, we'll generally people will exp have symptoms that we're gonna talk about in a second. Now, why does, how does bar position relate to the pelvic angle? Well, if our bar position is, let's say, too low, it can, it will often pull the, the pelvis out of posture and either cause it to tip forward more than it wants to or more than it's stable. But if it doesn't cause the pelvis to tip forward, what it can also do is cause the pelvis to slide forward. And if we slide forward, now we're sitting, our sit bones are not resting on the proper part of the saddle and we're sitting on sort of the narrower section in the middle of the saddle. And this can create perineal pressure or soft tissue irritation. So there we go. There's our first start as what are the symptoms that you've pushed it too far for your pelvic angle? Well, Perineal pressure is one of them for the two reasons I just mentioned, either the, sa the, the pelvis having to tip forward too much or the pelvis sliding forward into the wrong place on the saddle. Another symptom is low back discomfort, especially when the pelvis does not tip excessively. It's avoiding that, let's say. It can actually force a little bit of, um, of a, put a little leverage on the lower spine, and this can create some back symptoms. And then the third most common symptom, the third thing we see with this is when somebody has hand pressure, hand numbness, because when that pelvis is tipped forward too much or it's slide forward out of, out of position, it makes it difficult for us to bear proper amounts of weight through the pelvis and also actually through our feet as well. And when we're not bearing the proper weight at those two points, it's going to put more pressure on the, our hand position. 
And this can, again, lead to hand pressure, hand numbness. It can even lead to uh, shoulder discomfort, neck discomfort, because we're just bearing more weight through the upper body. Okay, now let's look at our second limiter, which is hip flexion. So what is hip flexion? Hip flexion is essentially just the amount that we are uh, raising our thigh up, essentially, through the pedal stroke. And it doesn't matter, it can be in any posture. Essentially, the closer we get our torso and our thigh, okay, that's closing the hip, you could say, is hip flexion. Now, most of us have plenty of gross hip flexion range of motion to satisfy the pedal stroke. Cycling does require a certain amount, and certainly the more aggressively we position our torso, it, it'll require us generally to have more hip flexion. But even then, most of us have enough to accommodate even that. The problem comes in is is, is it relates to the speed at which we're required to pedal. When you take a, a, an, any activity that requires us to generate force and you throw a speed component onto it, and pedaling at 85 to 90 RPM is still pretty fast, it will require you to work through a narrower portion of your range of motion in order for you to remain efficient in, in generating power, etc. Put more simply, our muscles, our joints, we are generally more efficient when we are working closer to the middle of our range. The further we move from the middle of that range, the, the more difficult that's going to be. So again, while most of us have enough hip flexion, it can be difficult to take advantage of all this motion while we're pedaling at our normal cadences. Our normal cadences require us to shorten the range up a little bit. And so what happens when we get that bar too low? Well, now we're moving maybe into a couple of degrees too much hip flexion, where the body tries to avoid it, essentially. Now, generally, it will try to avoid it more at one side than the other because most of us have one side that is actually better at it and better moving into that motion than the other. And the way we avoid it, what happens is the most common thing we see is when somebody hikes their hip up. And so you see a lot more hip vertical motion in through somebody's pedal stroke in this case. Additionally, it can also cause some uneven sort of muscle activation through the glutes and the lower extremity uh, muscles. And it can cause us to also sit off the side of the saddle or skewed with one hip further forward, again, in, a, in trying to avoid moving too far into the range for one hip. So these are, these are the we've pushed it too far symptoms that I was talking about for hip flexion. The first being vertical hip motion, the hips moving up and down too much, either on one side or both sides. Now this is something that does, it is easier when you have a partner that can, you know, that is watching you pedal. And often I hear from spouses or riding partners that say, oh, this individual, yeah, I know, I always notice that their, that their hip is moving this way or it's moving up or they're sitting off the side of the saddle or they're sitting, you know, one hip further forward. They're just not straight on the saddle. And so it does help to have somebody there to, to kind of take a look at you. You can also take a look at this just by shooting some video of yourself on a stationary trainer. But all of these things are, again, symptoms of you know, potentially that the bar position is too low. In many circumstances when I had people with, and this is the problem, and they are skewed and they, or they are shifted off to one side or they do have one hip moving up uh, vertically too much or all the above, when we get their bar position set properly, when it is the main problem, their, their symmetry on the saddle immediately begins to improve. Now, what other symptoms might you, be, might you experience? Well, a really common one is one-sided sit bone discomfort on the saddle. And this, again, goes back to how we're sitting because we're sitting skewed and we're exerting uneven pressure on the saddle. And then finally, the, what the last most common thing is back pain. And many people mistake it for, oh, we must be flexing the spine too much. And it's not just spinal flex, it's not just lumbar flexion. We Again, like hip flexion, most of us have enough trunk flexion in order to make it through a, a standard pedal stroke. It's just that the speed and the reciprocal nature of the ped, of pedaling can introduce a little bit of rotation. And so you take that little bit of leverage that's happening at the lumbar spine, and then you add some rotation to it, and that's what can create the problem, is that torsion can create extra stress. Okay, so if you are testing whether you can go lower, and you've lowered your bar by changing the stem of maybe a couple of degrees, or removing a spacer from underneath the stem, because you want to take it slow, and you do that, and you start to get some symptoms, whether it's perineal pressure, whether it's low back pain, it's more hand pressure, or that you get you, you notice that one sit bone is getting more irritated as you ride, uh, or you know, riding partners, or visually you can see that you're not sitting as square as you were before, then you know that, okay, that change, that, that was too much. And again, if you are someone that already has some of these symptoms and you're wondering if the bar height is the culprit, raising the bar position 
and going through and testing and seeing how these symptoms, do they resolve any? So that's the other way that you can use this. Now keep in mind, this is not perfect. This is not comprehensive. It's really not feasible to provide a comprehensive list of everything that can tell you that your bar height is, 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 is misplaced. These are just the most common ones. So I'm gonna shoot an addendum to this video. And what it is going to be is, it's gonna focus mostly on the hip flexion issue that we just talked about. And it's really three simple kind of tests or kind of quick assessments that you can do on yourself and see if perhaps hip flexion might be part of the problem. Again, it's not a perfect or comprehensive test. By no means is meant to diagnose anything. It's merely just to give you a sense of, you know, to some degree, your symmetry and whether you have some, maybe some uh, limitation there that needs to be either addressed or accommodated for on the bike. So that's all for this one. Thanks everyone for hanging in there. Go check out that second video and I'll see you next time.